Fasting can be as simple or as complex as you truly want to make it. Ranging from the person that just wants to play around with their eating windows and structure their timing a little bit, all the way down to the person that wants to truly biohack their body and get down to the nitty gritty of what they put in their body after breaking a fast. But the purpose of this video is to give you a breakdown of the big fast breaking mistakes. Okay, these are the big things that people hiccup on whenever they're breaking a fast. So I wanted to lay them out because rather than doing videos on how to specifically break a fast, it's easier for me to do a video on what not to do. And then from there, you can work in whatever you need to work in. You are tuned in to the leading performance and nutrition channel on YouTube. We got new videos coming out every single Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday for our regular programming, and then a bunch of other videos that'll come out throughout the remainder of the week as well. And I wanna make sure that you check out highly.com so you can get all the latest and greatest apparel that I'm always wearing in my videos. So be sure to check them out. All right, let's get down to what not to do or the three biggest fast breaking mistakes. I'm gonna lay them down one by one. Okay, the first thing, when we are breaking our fast, unfortunately, we should not be consuming veggies. Okay, I am just as healthy as the next guy. I am a big proponent of consuming lots of veggies. I'm a huge fan of Dr. Berg's work where he always condones consuming a lot of veggies and promotes that. But right when you're breaking a fast is not the time to be loading up on veggies. You see, some arguments will say that when you break a fast, it's the best time to consume your veggies because you're gonna absorb most of those nutrients and you're gonna get all the power from it. That would be true, but we have a few things that stand in our way. We have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that stands in our way. We have sugars like raffinose that stand in our way. And we have fiber that stands in our way. Let me break these down a little bit. So by small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, I mean what happens is after you break a fast or after you're done fasting, your body is very, very sensitive. And that means your gut's sensitive. So that means that you have a lot more of a tendency to have an overgrowth of bacteria when you do consume something. So veggies have different kinds of sugars and different kinds of fibers in there that are hard to break down and have a higher likelihood of fermenting. Now, fermentation is not a bad thing, but it can be hard to deal with when you're on a totally empty stomach after 16, 18, 20, 48 hours, okay? It can be really difficult. And what can happen is you can have this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that could just make you feel bloated. I'm not necessarily talking about a chronic condition here. I'm talking about just that feeling of distension and feeling pretty sick. Okay, and then we have things like raffinose. So raffinose is, a perfect example of raffinose is broccoli. Broccoli is very high in sulforaphane, but also in raffinose. And raffinose is a sugar that's hard to break down. So unfortunately, if you've ever had a large amount of broccoli, you've probably experienced that sulfur-like gas that you get. Okay, well, the gas portion is coming from the raffinose. It's the sugar that's not breaking down. The sulfur smell, the rotten egg smell, that's coming from the sulforaphane. So we're getting these two components that can be really hard to break down. Broccoli is literally my favorite vegetable. So for me to tell you that you shouldn't be consuming broccoli right when you break a fast, Honestly, it must have some merit there. So try to keep the veggies to a minimum. The other thing is fiber, okay? We have prebiotic fibers. Prebiotic fibers are great, okay? Those are in things like asparagus and all that stuff. And what that does is that grows your existing gut bacteria, okay? So probiotics add bacteria into your gut. Prebiotics encourage the flourishing and the growth of the existing bacteria. So these fibers are good normally. But again, when you're in a totally fasted state, your stomach has shrunk, and you're also at a point where your gut lining is a little bit more fragile. This can cause this fiber, this prebiotic fiber issue, to grow your gut bacteria in a very skewed way, okay? So let's go ahead and let's move on to the next biggest fasting mistake, okay? This is combining your carbs with your fats. Okay, now, for first reference, I'm only gonna talk about those that are not following a ketogenic diet. Now, if you follow my channel, you know I talk a lot about keto, so I'm gonna address that as well. But first and foremost, if you're not doing keto, you're just practicing intermittent fasting, what's gonna happen is when you combine your carbs with your fats is you're creating an insulin spike. Okay, this insulin spike from the carbs can allow the fats to come into storage. So let's address the non-ketogenic portion first. And I drew a little graph here to have it all make sense. But basically, if you're not keto, you actually wanna go higher glycemic carbohydrates without fats. So here's what this graph means. Okay, so the blue line is simply going to be what happens if you do not have low glycemic carbs. Okay, now this sounds crazy, right? Why on earth would I ever be condoning the use of higher glycemic carbohydrates? Well, just when you see this graph, it all makes sense. So here's what happens if you have a higher glycemic carb. You can have this little spike for meal one, and then when you actually have your bigger meal, 
then you're gonna be able to control that spike. Okay, so I always recommend breaking a fast with a smaller meal and then like an hour, an hour and a half later, then have your bigger meal. It's easier on your digestive system and trust me, you're gonna get a lot more benefit by having a smaller first meal. I call it your break fast meal. Okay, so that's what you wanna do. So here's your break fast meal. You're gonna have that bigger insulin spike because you're having something higher glycemic, something like, I don't know, maybe a rice cake or something like that, okay? Not sugar. You're gonna have that spike and then you're gonna crash. Whoa, whoa, you're actually telling me to have a blood sugar crash? Yeah, believe it or not, I don't want you to crash, but what's gonna happen is if you are in control, this can work to your advantage because you have this little dip here, but you know that you're having meal two. Meal two is when you can have the lower glycemic carbs, okay, the ones that are like maybe the uh, chickpea pasta or the lentils or lower glycemic carbs, sweet potatoes, things like that. That's when you can have all of those. You don't wanna break your fast with those. Here, the red line is what happens when you have that, when you have the low glycemic carbs upon breaking your fast. So sure, you don't spike your blood sugar as high. It takes longer to go up. But then what happens is since you are planning on eating an hour or an hour and a half later, you haven't come down yet. So you're still at your peak or close to it. And then you go ahead and you have your second meal and you're just adding on top of that, it compounds. So basically what happens is by the time you've completed meal two, your blood sugar is just spiking more and more and more. So you're elevating your blood sugar to a non-even level to where you're having it really, really high. And whether it's keeping even or not, we just don't want our blood sugar to ever get that high. So if you can control this meal one, you make it so that right at this valley, right when you start to drop and get tired, you're actually eating again. Okay? Now, fortunately, with fasting, you have a lot of hormones that are working to your advantage, so you're not developing this vicious circle where you're just going to want to eat and eat and eat and eat. You're strategically having a small amount there. Okay, so that's why you want to go higher glycemic if you're not keto. I know it sounds crazy, and trust me, normally I wouldn't condone that. If you're not doing fasting, don't do that. Okay? The next thing I want to talk about in this spectrum is, of course, not combining the fats with the carbs. So when we do have this spike in insulin, what happens is it opens the cell doorway. And right after a fast, we're very sensitive to insulin. So the insulin opens the cell like this, and then what's gonna happen is the carbohydrates go into the cell for energy. But what happens is we've opened the door. So fats that are coming in the body too, they go along for the ride and they go right into the cell. That's a quick, surefire way to absorb carbs and fats at the same time. And fats, we don't wanna store that way. Okay, we wanna turn those into other kinds of fuel sources. We don't want fat storage. So that's why if you are gonna have carbs, keep it just carbs and protein in a higher glycemic fashion. Then if you are doing keto, it's a whole different ball game. You can have a little bit of fats, a little bit of protein, but of course keep the carbs out of the equation. I recommend going a little bit higher on the protein, a little bit lower on the fat if you're breaking your fast when you're keto. Uh, big meals like I already uh, addressed, they're a no-no. We don't wanna have big meals as our first meal. Simply put, stomach distensibility. Our stomach has shrunk. We don't wanna do that. It's very hard on the system. We don't have the gastric juices at the time. We don't have the digestive enzymes at the time. And we can throw off our gut flora. We need to start it off easy. Our body sort of reverts to a very, very simple form after 16 hours of fasting and of course longer. Okay, now let's get on to the next one. Uh, grains, lectins, and dairy. Now I say grains with a grain of salt, no pun intended. Okay, with grains, I highly recommend just avoiding gluten and avoiding the processed grains. If you can get your hands on higher glycemic grains that are clean, I'm okay with that. Like an organic rice cake to spike your insulin might not be a bad idea if you're not in keto. You'd probably be okay with that. But lectins, you've probably seen my videos on lectins. This is a little bit complex. Uh, so I don't wanna go into a whole lot of detail because it's a pretty simple video that I wanna keep for, for everybody. But lectins are gonna be things that are gonna be in a lot of beans, okay? So you're gonna wanna avoid beans, things like that. Uh, then you also wanna limit your dairy. So in essence, what we're getting out of this is for a very small period of time with breaking your fast, you need to eat a very, very controlled diet. But it's the one time. If you can just control that one little window, you have a lot more flexibility the rest of the day. So just be very, very critical about what you put in your body during that first period where you break your fast. So what happens with grains, lectins, and dairy is your gut layer, like I mentioned before, becomes very, very fragile, okay? It's uh, your gut mucosal layer that protects your gut basically comes back down to about 50% of what it normally is after fasting. And grains, lectins, and dairy 
are all known to have what is called a prostaglandin response. And this prostaglandin response can trigger inflammation within your gut. And when your gut is already susceptible to inflammation, it's the last thing you wanna be doing. And what this does, this causes a heavy immune reaction. So basically you're breaking down your gut wall, then you're triggering an inflammation response, which is cascading into all kinds of different immune responses, which is gonna make you feel lethargic, make you feel sick, and make you feel, quite frankly, like you have an autoimmune disease. So those of you who know people that have dealt with autoimmune disease know it's not fun. Well, you can feel symptomatic. You can feel those symptoms like a heavy immune reaction similar to autoimmune conditions, even if it's just temporary. So that's why people that eat a lot of dairy when they break their fast, like I know a lot of people that do keto, and then they will go ahead and they will break their fast with a bunch of cheese. And then they feel like garbage. Well, it's simply put, it's that. It's the inflammation coming from the BCM7 and uh, some of those, those A1 beta caseinates and stuff like that. So that's what we wanna pay attention to. So if you could follow these rules or stay away from these things, that's your first step. Okay, you're off to the races. Now there's a lot of little idiosyncrasies that we could throw in here, and a lot of little things that you could follow, and I encourage you to go the extra mile, but for now, this is the basics. So share this with your friends and family that are learning to fast and are wanting to experiment, and let them realize that if they know the ropes, they can get a lot done. So as always, make sure you're keeping it locked in here on my videos. If you have ideas for future ones, or you have some really interesting comments or interesting questions, put them down below and I'll answer them in another video. See you guys soon.